Today we're going to look at chapter 10, I believe it's 10 9, uh, in Shigli. Um, I believe that's the one it is. Yes, fatigue loading of helical compression springs. So we're going to still look at our compression springs. Um, they're still uh, helical, so they're still um, round helix shape. Um, but now we're going to look at fatigue loading. So you load them over and over again, and do they eventually fail or not? Um, so we'll go back to our same thing we've been looking at with the valve springs in a car because they're good uh, compression springs to look at. Um, and I already have pictures sorted of those. So we'll look over there. Um, here's some. So this is, you know, this is actually my car uh, and or one of them. And uh, underneath here is the valve, the head where the valves are located. This is not my car over here. Uh, this picture is just one we found last time. Um, now this one does show the uh, the conical shaped valve springs. They get smaller at the top. Um, we're still not dealing with those. Um, we're still dealing with ones that look like this, um, where they're more cylindrical. Um, but this is what uh, these springs that we're going to deal with look like. And if you look really, I don't know if it'll show on your picture or not, but if you look really close at this particular picture, um, you can see all these little dimples on the surface. Maybe. Uh, if you can't pretend they're there, you can kind of pick them up in the reflections anyway. Um, that is a surface treatment particular to, well, it's not just for springs, but other things uh, have this sort of surface treatment, but springs in particular have this sort of surface treatment often. Um, and it's called shot painting. So over here, you've got these tiny little, now there's shot painting the gear, helical gear over here, but uh, all these tiny little BBs are being shot at the surface of whatever it is you're trying to protect against fatigue. And this is an important um, process in springs in particular because uh, they do have, you know, obviously cycle back and forth usually. You know, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're more static, but um, these valve springs would cycle back and forth because um, they would constantly be being pushed down to open a valve and then back up to close a valve and over and over and over every time your engine turns over. Um, and what this surface finish does is it basically makes all these little micro dimples, you know, whatever size these little BBs are over here, um, all these little dimples in the surface of the spring. And what it does is it uh, sort of creates little craters everywhere that try to stretch out the outer surface. So it wants to get bigger, but it can't because it's, you know, it's attached to the spring. Um, and what it creates is a compressive layer underneath that dimpled surface. And if you remember compression and how fatigue originally uh, tries to or originate a lot of times, uh, the fatigue failure anyway, um, is through micro cracks. And if you have compression holding the cracks closed, then you have uh, less chance for the cracks to grow. And so that's what the uh, shot peening treatment does is it tries to create this compressive layer underneath the surface that um, keeps the little tiny cracks that create uh, the beginnings of fatigue failure, tries to keep them closed. Um, and so we have many times uh, springs that are going to be in, you know, a, a high cyclic action are going to be shot peened. Now you can't always do that because it's going to be, if it's a small spring, then you might not can get on the inside of the spring to shot peen. Um, and so there is, some, there are some limitations on what can be shot peened and what can't be. Um, but basically you have to be able to get in or around, uh, the entire surface. Obviously, if you leave part of the surface unpeened, then you haven't treated that surface section. And this one, it actually, this picture is, I don't, maybe I can make it bigger and it would show up. Let's see. Let's make it a little bigger. Maybe you can start to see all these little dimples in here. Um, and you can kind of see they're on the inside also. Obviously it's harder to get inside the thing to peen in the first place, but um, this one has been shot peened. Um, and that's going to be important later on. Uh, one of We're going to get to a point where one of the criteria that we need to evaluate is, was the spring peened or unpeened? Um, and once we know, once we get to that point, then uh, we'll take one of two different paths. Um, we'll use one that has been peened. Uh, a lot of times valve springs are. All right. So this is our example over here. We're going to look at um, fatigue life, uh, basically a factor of safety uh, for something that would be a valve spring in a little, this is a 289 
uh, Ford small block. And we're going to get some typical numbers for that. Um, nothing fancy, just typical numbers uh, for what a valve spring in that particular engine might experience. So uh, it's going to have a preload. So I'm just going to work in MathCAD for... Actually, we'll probably have to jump out of MathCAD at one point because MathCAD doesn't like one of these equations. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on for now. So 65 pounds, that means, remember, the springs are originally some height. You compress them down a little bit, um, and the 65 pounds is kind of the minimum for this application in that particular engine. 65 pounds is the minimum amount of force that uh, it's going to have as a seat pressure. I know it causes a pressure usually, but it's uh, in pounds force over here. Um, when you open the valve the entire way uh, for this particular application the load um, let's just call it f max so the force that you're applying to the spring to open it as much as it's going to open it's not coil bound at this point but it's close uh, is around 145 pounds force um, the lift, so how much are you going to open it? So I don't have a picture that really shows the valve. You can see the stem of the valve right in that area right there. Um, but on the other end, you know, down inside the engine, there's a, a valve that's opening. And so you push this uh, spring down some amount to open that valve. For this engine, we're going to call that lift is 0 0.512 inches. That's a kind of normal value for this 289 engine um, obviously this number can be much larger much smaller depending on the engine and the application um, we're just looking at this particular one um, let's say our mean coil diameter you know remember that's the average coil diameter not the outside not the inside but right in the middle um, and it's variable d let's say that's 1.25 inches it's around that um, i actually don't know i'm kind of guessing on that one uh, i didn't want to go try and find one of these to measure and I couldn't find an easy to get to number. Um, let's say that they are chrome, oops, not chrome, chrome silicon um, material so that we can look up some material properties in our book and that's one of the, that's a typical valve spring type material and um, that is in our book. Um, let's say that we want a factor, oops, that's gonna make it a variable though factor of safety equal to 1.2. Now, last time we had this 1.2 as a factor of safety Safety if you closed it all the way. So if it was fully coil bound, so it was all the way at its closed compression height, you wanted a factor of safety of 1.2 against yielding. Um, here, you're not going to close, hopefully, you're not going to close the valve, uh, well, you're not going to close the spring uh, completely. So the coils aren't going to touch one another um, so at our maximum force that we're going to apply, we want a factor of safety of 1.2 at that point. So it won't be all the way closed. Um, and let's set our fractional overrun to closure. Remember that is zeta. Or no, not xi. Uh, not zeta. Um, and we want it at the minimum recommended amount, which was 0 0.15. That's a, remember there's a chart in your book. Uh, I don't know if I can find it really quickly or not, but uh, not a, not necessarily a chart, but a list of recommended parameters right here. Right here. And uh, fractional overrun to closer, the minimum amount they recommend is 0.15, so we're going to set it at the minimum amount. Um, setting it at the minimum at least meets our standard here, and it makes the spring as short as it can possibly be. So we don't want this giant tall uh, spring. Uh, for one thing, if you have, let's go back to the picture. If you have a taller spring, that means that this valve stem right here has to be longer. Um, and now you have more mass that you're having to move with that valve. Um, and so you don't really usually like that. You want that to be as a uh, small amount as possible. That will help with the spring surge and valve float that we talked about last time at the critical frequency stuff. All right, um, I think that's all of our given information that we're gonna deal with. So we're given all of this, um, but we're not given things like, 
we need to find um, what do we need to find? We need to find wire diameter. So that would be D. Um, we don't know the free length. We know, uh, actually, we don't know anything. We might have to, um, I guess we can calculate some of them, but uh, we don't know anything about the free length. We don't know the number of coils. So, so this is a open-ended design uh, similar to what we did last time, except last time we had set wire diameters that we were choosing from. Here, let's not limit ourselves to set wire diameters. We're, otherwise, um, you know, you could just go plug in the ones that are close to what you think and pop out some numbers here. Let's say that we're designing this from the ground up and uh, we're not limited by wire diameter. So it's a variable, a continuous variable now. So we need to find all of these things. Uh, we do need to assume a couple of things though. So our assumptions will be um, that uh, we're going to use what's called the Zimmerli or Zimmerli. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it. <clears throat> this is um, this actually relates back to that peened versus shot peened or, or well unpeened um, status. And uh, your book gives you two sets of numbers on page 528. And they say that basically this guy, he goes and does a bunch of uh, experiments on springs, uh, coil springs. And it, this is reading from the book. He discovered the surprising fact that size, material, and tensile strength have no effect on the endurance limit for infinite life. Um, and so it comes down to just these particular numbers. Um, oh, now it is a limited on, on spring sizes or wire diameters less than 10 millimeters, um, which we will certainly be, we're not going to design a valve spring with a 10 millimeter wire diameter that, for our engine anyway. That would be a much bigger thing. Um, and so the, then you get these two charts, uh, equations 1028 and 1029, that give you... Um, in endurance strengths for alternating your mid-range numbers. So basically, basically what he does, what these numbers do, is you remember you have your uh, alternating, oops, not that, alternating, and mid-range, um, and uh, then you have Gerber or ASME elliptic or Soderberg or one of those curves. We're going to use ASME elliptic, by the way, for this one. So you have your ASME elliptic curve. He gives you, I don't know where these correspond to, but he gives you one point on this curve. And so he defines that curve by this one point, basically. And our job is to figure out, are we, uh, are, is our combination of alternating and mid-range inside the safe zone or outside? And if it's inside, then how much factor of safety do we have before we reach the boundary of the unsafe region? Um, and so that's what these numbers are going to uh, tell us. And there's two sets. There's one set of, for this coordinate, and I don't know exactly where the thing, I didn't plot it. Um, but there's one set that if it has been unpeened, then creates one curve. Um, and there's another one that it's been peened, and it creates another curve. And I guess it's up to you. Uh, do you want to put ASME elliptic through this point? or Gerber, or what you want to put through this point, but um, we're going to put ASME elliptic. That's what I'm attempting to draw here. And then we're going to work to figure out, are we in the safe side or the unsafe side for infinite life? All right. Um, and so those are on page 528. So we're going to assume those. Um, remember also that there were many ways in your book to figure out uh, what are you going to use for your yield strength. Are you going to use 0.45 times the ultimate strength, 0 0.65, 0, you know, what are you going to use? We're going to use the Seminov. I can't, uh, there's actually a, a accent mark on here that I can't type in uh, MathCAD, but uh, Seminov, and that's on page, um, let's find the page. It is on page 517. Oh, wow. 
in. And um, it is the one where the factor is set to be 0.56. So 56% of your ultimate strength um, is how you will calculate your yield strength. <clears throat> so we'll use that. And again, there's several different ones of these uh, that are available. Um, and like I said earlier, we'll use ASME elliptic. When we go to calculate our factor of safety against infinite life, we'll use a new one that is specific to springs, and that's called the signs criteria. Or criterion, I don't know exactly. Um, anyway, this one uh, is another um, study, empirical study, that said that, you know, it doesn't even look like the mid-range stress matters on these compression springs. Um, it's only the alternating one. So that kind of looks like there's, back over here, there's no mid-range at all. And somewhere there's just a line. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm not going to draw it through the same point that I built for Semenov. So we're going to put it somewhere else just because it's not the same thing. So signs just says, are you below the line and safe or above the line and not safe um, for infinite life? And so it'll, it will give us a number here for what is, uh, actually we'll just calculate a factor of safety. <clears throat> so it's not even a curve. It's just, are you under the line or above the line? And it's all on the alternating side of things. All right. All right. So let's go back to MathCAD. Um, I, what, as I wrote some of these in, I wrote all of, well, not the Chrome Silicon, but I wrote all of these as actual variables. So they're already plugged in as variables, assuming we remember their name. Um, but we've got to do a couple of other things. Um, first, we could calculate our spring rate, K. Um, we know a couple of things here. We know the starting force, so how much force is on this thing when it's at rest. You know, it's, not, it's, it's installed height. So maybe we'll write that out. It's compressed a little bit when it's installed. Uh, and those, so there's a 65 pound force when it's installed and, and not being pushed down, um, at least not by the rocker arm. This guy's the rocker arm up here. Um, and then when we do push it down as far as it's going to go, not all the way coil bound, so the coils aren't touching one another, but um, we're applying 145. So we have this delta F and we have how far it moved. So we can figure out a spring rate. So we could do F uh, max minus what we called F, I think we called it preload. I put the wrong symbol there. Um, oh, actually, no, we just called it preload. All right. And divide by the lift. I don't remember if I made it capital. I think I did. There we go. And it comes out in weird units, so let's change them to pound force per inch. Um, so 156 pounds per inch. Um, when we did this previously, I think we had maybe 170 pounds per inch, something like that. This is a typical number, so that doesn't concern me. Um, so now we have our spring rate. Um, let's go ahead and calculate our ultimate strength. So last time, I think we actually went to a separate chart outside of the book and found a material, some material properties there. This time, let's go in the book to this page. So this is page uh, 517, there we go, 517. Uh, and here's a selection of wires, wire materials. And um, we said we had the chrome silicon, so that's this one. And what this table gives us is A and M to put into this equation to calculate the ultimate strength uh, of our wire material. And uh, we have some SI units and some uh, US units to choose from and uh, chrome silicon in this range we expect our wire diameter to be somewhere between these two this is a large wire diameter and this would be a smaller one so uh, than a typical valve spring would have so we expect this range to make sense so we need 202 KSI for A and 0.108 for M into this equation now we don't have D yet so um, we're just going to write this one in as a uh, symbolic equation. So S, 
ut equals um, and notice in MATCAD I've got this kind of equal sign for oh you're not looking at MATCAD there we go um, we've got this kind of equal sign when we want to define an equation and this one when we want to define a symbolic relationship so it's not going to actually do anything with this I'm just basically writing it down and we can manipulate it later um, so SUT is equal to a over d to the m and we do have values for a is 202 ks now it has actually the units are ksi times inch to the m power so i don't want to put those in as uh, units for, so for right now i'm going to leave the units off entirely there we go um, and we'll deal with that later m is 0 0.108 and those are both numbers from table 10.4 so if we can find wire diameter d lowercase d then we can figure out our ultimate uh, strength of our material but we don't have that um, to get our yield it's similar it will be the uh, Semenov number which we looked up um, on page 517 and it says it's 56% of the ultimate strength so this equation again I wrote it in symbolically because we don't we can't actually calculate the ultimate strength right now um, C our spring index I don't remember the equation number but it, all it is is mean coil diameter divided by wire diameter same thing we can't um, actually calculate that yet because we don't know the wire diameter so a lot of this depends on wire diameter um, Bergstrasser so when we want to calculate the stress uh, remember there's a curvature effects because the uh, coil spring is coiled um, and curved and so we have KB uh, again this one's going to rely on C which relies on wire diameter so we're going to write it in symbolically um, and it is 4 times C um, plus 2 over 4 times C, whoops, capital C, minus 3. And that's the equation, uh, it's 10, 5. So that's, I believe. All right. So this is, these are all the things, actually, well, there's one more, the actual stress equation. Tau. Um, would equal KB, oh, K Bergstrasser, times, I believe it's uh, 8 times whatever F, you know, force max or whatever force we want to put in there, um, times the, oops, times the mean coil diameter over pi times D wire diameter cubed. So all of these, starting all of these, depend on knowing the wire diameter. But we know everything else. You know, we, we know the mean coil diameter. We know the force we want to apply. Um, we know uh, a lot of these other things. There's just one variable that is not known. So if we can put this into a common equation and solve for that one variable, then uh, we should be able to figure out what the wire diameter is. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to take all of these and put them into one equation. So tau, uh, that's the stress that we would normally calculate here. We, we know its magnitude. Its magnitude is um, SSY. That's our... Actually, let's write it out, though, so that we can see all the numbers. So 0.56 times SUT, which is 202, um, actually it's 202,000 because that was KSI, um, divided by D, we don't know, raised to the 0 0.108. So this number here, actually we, we will need that number later because that's uh, going to go into our ASME elliptic. That's our um, SSY, so our yield strength. Um, we want a factor of safety of 1.2, so we're going to divide that by 1.2. Control equals, though that's MathCAD, um, 
to get the symbolic equals in there, control, control equals in the old um, MathCAD 15. Um, Bergstrasser is this guy for, but instead of C, let's put the definition of C. So um, our mean coil diameter, 1.25. I am leaving the units off of this one um, because of the A in there creates problems. So we're just putting them in in the right uh, magnitudes. Uh, 1.25 over, whoops, not minus, over wire diameter, which we don't know, um, plus two, all of that over four times 1.25 inches over wire diameter minus three. So this term, all of this is Bergstrasser. That is multiplied times eight times F. Um, our maximum force was the way up here. 145 pounds. I'm going to again put that in as 145. I put this one in as pounds per square inch when I added the uh, thousand over here. So I'm going to put this as pounds also. It's not KSI. Um, wire diameter. So 1.25 inches. All of that divided by pi d cubed. Now, MathCAD does not like solving this equation for some reason. Um, I don't, I tried a couple of different ways, putting it in a solve block, just solving for a variable and all that. And it never did really like that. It did it sometimes and other times it would lock up my computer. So I'm not gonna try it right now because there's a decent chance that it will lock up the computer again. Um, but what actually, this calculator solved it fine, just putting it into the solver on the little Casio. Um, I actually went over to Wolfram. Let's see if I can get it up here. Um, there we go. Put it into Wolfram, um, just like you saw it on MathCAD. Told it to solve for lowercase d. It took it, I don't know, 20 seconds, something like that, and it spit out two numbers. Um, actually, it says that um, I exceeded my computation time, uh, but it still did spit out the, these two numbers. Now, obviously this, uh, solution, you know, there's multiple solutions because I've got a polynomial here. Um, this one's not right. 1.6 inches for wire diameter is not going to be the wire diameter I need for a foul spring in a 289 Ford engine. But this one is the same number that my Casio spit out. Uh, so 0.1686. So I'm going to do 0.169 uh, as wire diameter. So let's put that over here. Inches. Now we can start going back through all of these um, equations that before we just had to leave as uh, symbolic representations because now we actually know the wire diameter. <clears throat> so let's see. Let's let's do this one first. This will, well, all right. We'll do that. This will be S S Y. So our yield strength. We'll need that for ASME elliptic, um, but not with the factor of safety on it. Um, and well, well, we'll leave it off for now. But actually, there's one oh, no, less PSI in it. There we go. Oh, it's gonna, yeah, because that has some, uh, let's leave the units off. Uh, the units on this number are actually, um, I don't know if it'll, I think they're inch. Yeah, but there's raised to the M, it's weird. I'm gonna leave the units off and we'll put them on later. Um, Let's get rid of these. Oh, whoops. If you ever want to uh, have a number that does have units, like this, this diameter has inches unit, um, you can divide the number uh, by those units to get rid of them if you're having issues with some oddball units in MathCAD. Um, not sure why it's doing this though. Oh, because I don't want units at all. There we go. Um, so we have a number now, um, for our, uh, yield strength 
So let's just redefine it. One, let's put it as a decimal. There we go. We have 137 KSI. Uh, 0.1. All right. <clears throat> now, if we do any change in the wire diameter, this number won't automatically change. But uh, we could go in and fiddle with the units and get them right. But I'm not going to worry with that. Um, C, we can do our spring index. C is just D over D. Oh, all right. So remember that uh, there is a recommended number for spring index or a range rather, and I believe it's four to 12. Yeah, four to 12 and we're at 7.4. So we're okay there. Let's see what else we have. <clears throat> Uh, we could calculate Bergstrasser. We don't actually need that, though, um, yet. I guess we will need it later um, if we want to calculate stresses. We'll need them, but um, we can plug that in later. Um, for now, let's go... We didn't write down the... Um, no, we didn't. All right. So let's go get the actual spring rate approximation. Uh, K... Um, equation 10 9 and it says well I want to write it as an equation k equals um, d to the fourth times g over 8 times d cubed times uh, number of active coils oops there we go so this is equation 10 9 remember it's an actually an approximation um, not a, uh, a equal sign, but I can't do approximation symbols in MATCAD. Um, G is the uh, modulus of rigidity. For our material, we can go to um, table 10.5 and look up modulus of rigidity for this, this guy. So uh, we have chrome silicon modulus of rigidity. G is 11.2 million PSI so 11.2 times 10 to this oh wow times 10 to the sixth PSI okay um, everything else in here we know now so we don't know number of active coils so let's solve for that And so we have now an equation for the number of active coils. And we can solve to find, okay, we have a really low number of active coils. That's probably actually below the recommended uh, range for number of active coils. Let's see. Well, they don't, yeah. Well, no, actually it's not. It's just at the very bottom. So number of active coils, um, should be between 3 and 15. We are just above 3, so we're still in an okay range there. It's just a smaller number than what we've been using. Um, so we're good. Uh, let's see what we need next. So if we have our number of active coils, now um, we know our number of total coils. Um, you, if we use table 10, 1, this table... So if we use this table, um, we need to know the types of ends that are on the valve spring. So we got to look at the picture. Here they are. Um, you can see how they're tapered off at the end. That's the ground part. And you can see how this last uh, coil is squished up against the one above it. That's the closed part. So um, actually your book says... Uh, squared or closed um, and then there's a squared and ground so let's look at that so we're over in the squared and ground so it's closed or squared those terms are interchangeable and then ground is the it's tapered off at the bottom ground flat so we're in this column which says total coils is equal to active coils plus two so that one is a simple enough equation to build in here just got to go back down to where we were 
So total coils is uh, active coils plus two, so 5.7. Um, and it's okay that we have fractional number of coils. That's fine. So this was one of the things we're actually trying to solve for. Oops. I want to highlight it. There we go. One of the things we're trying to solve for. Um, the other things were the factor of safety for fatigue failure. Um, and then the free length. We haven't done the free length yet. Um, so if we have our total coils, now that we do, we can find our solid length is just for, it's in that same table, I should have pointed it out there, but it's equal to the wire diameter times the total number of coils you have. Uh, and it's, this equation is different depending on the different uh, end conditions of the coil. So um, this is for squared and ground, which is what we have. So it's a little under an inch tall when you could compress it entirely we're not ever going to be able to compress it entirely unless well, i don't know what would have to happen in our engine for that to be even possible so but that is its solid height which means now we can figure out um well we set early on our fractional overrun to closure um oh, maybe i didn't oh yeah there we did we set it um at 0.15 that was the minimum recommended amount. And we can use the equation um, on page, or well, it's equation 1017 on page, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, page 520. So equation 1017, page 520. That's the fractional overrun to closure equation. Um, and it says that the force at the solid height equals um, 1 plus fractional overrun to closure times the maximum force. Um, we know these, so we should be able to solve. Um, actually, I guess I don't have to put this in as a symbol. We know all that stuff, so there we go. So if we apply 167 pounds, then we will close the um, spring, you know, make all the coils touch one another. Our maximum force was 145 pounds. So we're just underneath that. And it's, it's, they're close together because we set fractional overrun to closure as a pretty small number, the minimum number that is recommended, 0.15. Okay. Um, now let's see. We have our solid uh force now let's go we're trying to get to our free length so here's how we're going to get to our free length um, if we have our solid force then we know that k the spring rate which we found early on uh times delta oops i didn't do times times delta solid so the amount of squishing that you have to do to get to solid um, will will give it the, that's an equality so this number delta solid is the amount you have to squish the spring from its free length so free length minus the solid length okay so I can Instead of writing this equation, I can write solid force, which I do know, equals K, which I know way at the, it was the 160 pounds per inch or whatever it was. Um, and instead of writing DS here, delta S, I can write this. So my equation will look like this. F solid equals K times, I keep writing the wrong thing, times uh, the free length minus solid length. I know all of the things, all the terms in this equation except for free length. So I'm going to solve for that. And there's an equation for the free length. And we can find the value in inches. So 2.038, that's a reasonable uh, free length for one of these little valve springs. So now we have 
Uh, that's another one of the terms that we were trying to find. Um, free link. So now we've got number of coils, total coils, and active coils. Um, and we have our free length. Um, now we need to start working on this idea of is this spring good for infinite life in our setting? All right, so let's go get that Zimmerly, Zimmerly data. This is on um, page 528. We looked at it, but we never typed it in. So if we go to page 528, we see that SSA, so the alternating stress, is uh, 57.5 KSI. And remember, there's two sets of these, peened or unpeened. We're going to do peened. So our spring has been shot with the little BBs. Let's do the mid range at 77.5 KSI. So again, that is this point. So this point has coordinates of uh, 77.5 and 57.5 KSI would give us that point. And now we're going to fit the ASME curve through that with no factor of safety and basically figure out um, what our endurance limit is going to be kind of backwards from what we've been doing it before. All right. So we need our ASME elliptic. Um, so we have to go back to chapter six. So this goes back um, equation 648 back a long time ago. Um, and what we're going to do with this now, this equation is going to have sigmas in it. Uh, and we need tau's because we're in a sheer failure with the springs. So we do have to convert it over converted for shear. Okay, so it will look like this one over our factor of safety squared. Now, again, we're trying to actually basically determine what curve is created by that one data point. So this is no factor of safety. This is the curve. So Rn will be one when we go to plug this in. And then we'll have um, alternating stress, which we don't know yet, alternating, over SE squared plus mid-range over S SY, which we do know, we just haven't actually written it down yet. In fact, let's do that now before we forget. So S SY equals way back up here. We'll have to find it. Here it is. Um, actually, we did write it down. We did write it down. It was the 137 KSI. So it was the Semenov fraction, so the 56% of our ultimate strength, which was calculated using the A value and the M value from that table. Uh, I don't remember the table number right now. Let's see. Table 10-4, I think. Yes, table 10-4, where is where A and M came from. So we actually do have SSY. All right. Um, we need our alternating and mid-range stresses, though. So how we're going to get those is, um, well, actually, we can. We have we have those um, because that's what um, that's what these are. That's what Zermerli is giving us. Um, so we have instead of alternating here, we're going to use. There's a Merlin number. Same thing here. And so we have this, this, this. Um, factor of safety, like I said, we are on the line, which means a factor of safety of one. Um, and so the only unknown in there is the endurance limit. So let's solve for that. Uh, okay, we get two. We don't want the negative one. So let's move this out of the way. So our endurance limit is this number, which equals 69.7 KSI. 
So now we have our endurance limit. We have um, our, our yield number. And now we can go find our factor of safety uh, for our situation. You know, what is our alternating stress? What is our mid-range stress? And are we in the safe side of our, you know, are we some, this is our point somewhere over here or is it out here somewhere? And we want it to be in the safe area. And then assuming it is in the safe area, we want to know, you know, what is the factor of safety? Um, how far away are we from the, you know, danger zone? All right. So let's do our tau max. So to get this, we're going to use the um, equation 10-2. I guess I can write this over to the side. And plug in F max, so our maximum force that we, the 145. Um, oh, we need Bergstrasser. Let's go ahead, instead of writing in the, uh, you know, the, uh, oh, what is it? The big equation with what we did earlier for Bergstrasser. Instead of doing the whole thing like we did here, let's actually calculate Bergstrasser. So KB equals four times C, which we do know now, um, plus two over four times, oh wow, over four times C minus three. 1.18, all right, so now we can just use KB instead of having to plug in that every time. So K Berg, Bergstrasser times um, eight times, we're doing max, so F max times the mean coil diameter divided by pi times wire diameter cubed. So this should be our maximum shear stress. Uh, let's do it in KSI. We did everything else in KSI. 113. Let's do the minimum one, which is very similar. But let's call it minimum. And instead of F max, um, the minimum force that our spring experience, we called preload. 50 KSI. <coughs> All right. Um, these are not uh, alternating in mid-range. So let's get alternating. Oh. Alternating is tau max plus tau min divided by two KSI. There's our alternating and mid range will be very similar to that. Um, tau max minus min over two. Okay, we've got alternating and mid-range. We need to plug those numbers into the, the ASME equation and find the factor of safety. And again, you could use one of the Gerber or Soderberg or one of the others. Same process, except that you wouldn't use this equation. You would use whatever their version of the equation is. And same idea, though. You use that, plug in a factor of safety of 1 with the Zermerli data, and then back out the endurance limit from that point. All right. Um, one over factor of safety squared. We're gonna have to solve this one, so let's make it symbolic. Tau A oops, over endurance limit, which we have now, squared plus mid range over yield squared all right now let's solve for this factor of safety we get uh, again we get two we don't need the negative one so in and hopefully it is greater than one no it is not Actually, 
I might have done something wrong because last time I solved it, it was greater than one. That's very strange. I might have had a different wire diameter the last time I did it, possibly. Although these numbers are the same. Oh, I might have had a different, uh, I did. No, nope, that's the same also. Hmm. That is very strange. I'm not sure exactly. I typed something different than I did last time. Um, but what this would tell us is if we did indeed have a factor of safety less than one, that uh, we wouldn't have infinite life. Wouldn't mean it would immediately fail because um, we actually did design it with a factor of safety of 1.2 um, against yielding back way back somewhere. We put the 1.2 in here. Uh, so we're not going to immediately fail on like the first cycle. But this set of numbers does show us that um, unless I made a miscalculation somewhere else, uh, then we would be uh, less than infinite life. At some point, it would fail. All right, um, let's check the uh, science criteria and see if it says the same thing. This one is the one that only uh, considers alternating stress. So it says that uh, based on data, you know, actually testing a bunch of springs, it seems like the alternating stress is the thing that dominates failure or not. Um, so here we have a factor of safety equal to um, the Zimmerli number for um, alternating, which was here, SSA. divided by what we actually have alternating. Oh, that's even worse. Huh, well, it says that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, even more likely that uh, this particular combination of wire diameter, coil diameter, uh, number of spring turns, um, material, all of that, uh, has a decent chance of not surviving an infinite life scenario. Um, if I see why I had different numbers than I did the first time I ran this, I'll post an update. But uh, actually right now I don't see why it's giving me a different set of numbers because everything else looks the same. But obviously I put something in somewhere a little bit differently. Um, but anyway, um, sometimes you do calculate that you're not going to have infinite life and that's okay as long as you know what uh, you know you have to have a service plan in place uh, or you have to rethink the wire diameter or the loads that you're applying or you have to rethink something along the way um, so what this process has done is it goes in all the way back to um, a couple of known so you it's tough to design these things with completely everything unknown uh, so we did set a couple of things. I actually think I know what it was. I think the lift that I originally uh, used was much smaller than this the last time I did it um, because I used a lift of, um, I think it was 0.35 or something like that. Uh, and I think that would have changed a lot of these different, that would have changed the spring rate basically uh, right up here. But um, maybe that's what it was. Uh, because I do think I had a smaller lift. I think this is a more typical lift for that particular engine though. Um, anyway, so you have some set values um, and you can build around those and you can use continuous process. So we didn't go in and set a specific wire diameter chart that only these wire diameters were gonna be considered. We actually left it as a continuous variable, which does make solving for it a little bit more complicated. Um, so you do have to, you know, have some way to solve it. You know, you're probably not going to solve that by hand. Actually, when they did solve these by hand, um, they sort of went back to the default of, well, I've only got, you know, five wire diameters in that range. I'm going to plug each one in and see which ones work. So kind of like what we did the last time with the chart. Um, 
but if we do have a solver that is capable of solving this, then um, might as well use it. And like I said, even this calculator, it took it maybe, it looked like it had locked up uh, because nothing was responding on the screen, um, but it took this particular calculator maybe 25 or 30 seconds of just sitting there uh, to solve it. Now, if you have the, um, the other Casio, the 115, um, it will solve it also, um, but it will take potentially a minute or so. You know, it might, it might look like it's locked up for a while, um, but it's not. It's actually in the background crunching numbers, and it will spit out the solution to this equation or to the diameter D. Okay, um, thank you. And we will look at one more spring topic next time that will be basically all the other types of springs. So we've looked at really just coil springs in compression, but you can have torsional springs, you can have um, extension springs, so you pull on them, um, and we'll just put all of those together into one topic uh, and look at that next time. Bye-bye.